Today, we're going to talk about the guy who tried to take another pot shot at former President Trump. Greg, let's tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, so these videos are from 2022 when he went to Ukraine to volunteer his service as a fighter and was rejected because of his age and lack of experience. That's all you know. Please tell me who you are and why are you here? Uh, I'm 56 from the U.S. US uh, from North Carolina originally, so I live in Hawaii now, so I flew all the way from Hawaii here. So the question as far as why I'm here, to me, you know, a lot of the other conflicts are gray, but this conflict is definitely black and white. This is about good versus evil. This is a storybook, you know, any movie we've ever watched, this is definitely evil against good. I mean, we're battling a situation here where you know, the U Ukrainians and the rest of the world are caring and kind and, and generous and, and unselfish and, and take care of one another. And it's just a matter of, you know, we need to stand up for that. That is the most important thing in the world is just to show human beings that we're kind and we're caring and that we take care of one another and that the world is united so that we feed each other and make sure that, you know, we, we all move forward as, as one collective whole unit. So, you know, we feel the pain of, of one country's failure and their conflicts, and we enjoy the successes of, of other countries that are doing good, and, and we all work together. And for some reason, Russia does not grasp this concept that we're, we're all one unit, and we have to get along and work together and, 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 and be normal human beings. This is 2022. We have to work together. It's, it's, it seems asinine that we have a, a leader in a country that does not understand the concept of of being unselfish and being generous and being kind and just the basic moral values that that are required by human beings these days it blows my mind all right greg what do you got I'm going to talk less today about body language and a lot about interrogation. So let's talk about this guy. There's usually you don't get the opportunity to capture a guy who tried to shoot someone. It, it happened with with um, Lee Harvey Oswald, but we saw that ended. When you do, you really are less concerned about getting a confession than you are about information. So when we talk about a lot of times we're in here talking about Reed and Reed is about getting to closure on a case. You already have a lot of information. You're trying to lock them down. When you do intelligence interrogation, it's about actionable intelligence to try to find other bad guys, how this guy radicalized, where he got the weapon, all kinds of things, how he knew the president would be there. So this becomes more like an intelligence interrogation. That's my world. So what we're after when we do that is we have to establish an approach that works. Now, the FBI has proponency for terror, and I'm assuming the same guys who would handle terror would handle this because this is domestic terror by any stretch. And when they go into this guy, they will have their profilers, people like Navarro and Schaefer, who worked over there for a while, who would give them a pretty good profile of this guy. These are guys whose title and jobs are behavior profilers and that kind of thing. If I'm correct, those two may have worked in another division, but they'll lock it down and give them something. The good news here is the more complex a person's life is, the longer and more complexity they've had in their life, the easier it is to build a profile so you can start finding gaps, start looking for a place to go in with that psychological ploy or approach that we try to do to get them to talk. In his case, it probably would be something around admiring him for his little manifesto thing he's done here and then later leaning into him like you do most narcissists. But the interesting piece for them is the more, I, you know, I, I've got to, if you go back to my background, I was in a place where I worked in processing in my beginning of my army career, then the old guard, then to interrogator school, language school, seer school, all that stuff gives you more entry points to me. And then 25 years in business, that gives you a lot more entry points to me than it would a salt miner where you got one thing to find rapport about. So it makes it a lot easier for them to go in and unpack the man. Now, remember, this guy's layer after layer after layer of a pearl that has some crack deep inside, and they're reaching for that crack. Let me hit, hit two or three body language things, and then we'll tie everything as we go. There's uncertainty when he's asked the question about what are you doing here? That's natural. He's in a foreign country trying to get a job working in yeah, effectively as a mercenary, whether he's being paid or not. And so his brows are up. He's got eye lock. Even when he moves his head, his eyes stay locked because he's trying to see what they believe. And then his eyes stay in the same exact place no matter how much he moves his head. He does that taffy pull for acceptance when he pulls this way. Then when he gets to telling, he goes in that down tone. This is a true believer. His body language matches his message. No matter how crazy that message is, when a person believes what they're saying, 
that gives you some insight into who they are. And I'm sure these guys are going to go after this. When I say these guys, the intelligence collectors for the FBI are going to go after every one of these things here. And they'll have a pretty good picture of who he is when they start building. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah. When you said true believer, of course, it reminds me of Eric Hoffer's book, The True Believer. That's the book actually Greg and I bonded over when we first met. Yep. Fantastic book. And what it talks about is the true believer of movements, like, f for example, fans of, of of a band or something like that. But it also works or it also uh, involves countries and how people who are. Uh, fanatics for that country and how you can, how they take over. It's, it's, you got to read it. Eric Hoffer, the true believer, fantastic book. So what we're seeing here is a true believer and it's really odd throughout all these videos and it pretty much stays the same. So I'm going to go over some of the things where we see what, what looks stable, but really isn't. For example, his blink rate that his blink rate is fairly low. I mean, 15, 20 times, a minute is about the average for the normal person. He's doing, he's blinking about 10 times a minute. That's not, that's not a whole lot at all. And he's explaining what he believes the the person he believes he is. As he's ex explaining these concepts and things, it's actually going back to him. And he's telling you who he thinks he is or who he is. And um, so this is him being him. I don't know how to say it, but that's what we're dealing with. Um, he uses the word we a lot. Like he's part of this big movement, and there's there is no huge movement that he's a part of or is leading. You know, it, it's it's so it's really odd from that perspective. His illustrators are on point. I think he believes what he's saying. I think he believes in in his in his mission, and because uh, when he talks, his illustrators are fairly low, so they're they're tough to see at first. So you see a little bit of, of movement in the shoulders, but then the camera comes back some because they're trying to get his hands moving around as well to see his illustrators. So those are on point. So I think he believes what he's saying, but I think he deliver he he um, he he has delusions of grandeur. So he thinks he's this this person who's coming in as a hero to save the day and hip everybody to what's happening. Come on, I can't believe people aren't here. That that's a that I'm not a psychologist, don't know much about it at all besides the books I read. But that's not good news. The 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 way he's presenting this, especially when when his. Uh, his vocal tone doesn't change much. His volume doesn't change much. His cadence doesn't change much. We see almost nothing as far as movement in the brow and his forehead. So it's really, it's really odd. It's really odd. I, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, I think this is a, a dangerous personality type. Obviously, you know, he's gone off and done some stuff that, that he shouldn't have done to try to shoot the president. So, or the, you know, the former president. So obviously, I, you know, it's easy to say that, but this is what they look like. All right, as I'm sure you can imagine, the shooting at the Trump rally in Pennsylvania has generated a lot of controversy in the media, contributing to an already polarizing landscape. This is why we reached out to Ground News to sponsor this video. Their app and their website let us get the full picture on what's happening. They combine the news from around the world so you can get context on the source of the information. So let's look closer at the coverage on President Trump's attempted assassination. Ground News gives me instant access to more than 700 articles reporting on it all over the world with context on each publication's political bias, factuality, based on how subjective or objective their language is, and even who is funding those people. So comparing news coverage is just fascinating to me. So left-leaning USA Today and uh, ABC News downplayed the shooting by writing that Trump was removed from stage after loud noises startled him and rang out in the crowd. The Irish Times went as far as victim blaming, adding that the assassination attempt might even help him win the White House. So right-leaning outlets like the Daily Signal and New York Post were really quick to call out liberal media's despicable coverage, reporting that their bias was on full display. And unfortunately, moments like these can cause polarizing and often very inaccurate narratives to spread really fast. And you wouldn't know unless you stayed informed through really diverse news sources, something ground news simplifies and excels at. And with media bias just running crazy like it is, I can't recommend subscribing to ground news enough. 
to stay fully informed on topics that, especially ones that tend to go from zero to ridiculous in no time at all, like Donald Trump or the 2024 elections. I am personally in the process right now of writing a book on elite media brainwashing and ground news is one of the most practical solutions I have ever seen. So go to ground.news slash TBP or just scan the QR code on the screen right here. And right now they're offering our subscribers for the behavior panel the same vantage plan that I use same plan for unlimited access to all their features. So subscribing not only supports an independent news platform that's working to make media more transparent, the entire landscape more transparent, you're going to be supporting the behavior panel as well. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is great because by analyzing what he does, what he says, you can understand what his beliefs are. And my definition of a belief is things we know to be true and require no more evidence around. So that's not things that are true. That's things that we know or I know to be true and require no more evidence around, which means you can't bring me evidence for what I know to be true and make me believe anymore. I already believe at my maximum. You can't bring me evidence to make me not believe. I would just won't listen to it. You know, I will shoot you at the gate before you can ever get your evidence in. So that's a belief, uh, as far as I'm concerned. What are his beliefs? That there is black and white. Yeah, there's just this and that. There's no gray area. He says there isn't any gray in this one. There's black and there's white. There's good versus evil. So there's a dichotomy here. There's only two elements to this. It's a binary world that he's living in here. He then uses a metaphor. He says he says it's a storybook. It's a storybook. It isn't a storybook. It's not literally a book that you can read a story from. So this is a metaphor. He's calling this conflict something that it is not not. And that's a metaphor. In a metaphor, you call something something that it is not. So he says, it's a storybook. So he has a storybook view of conflict. So it's quite a naive view of conflict where there's just black and white, good and evil. There's no gray area in there. And anybody who understands the complexity of conflict, of any conflict, is going to go, hang on, that's quite naive or maybe even delusional. The conflict is never really that simple. So he says um, that there's uh, Ukraine and the, and the rest of the world, Ukraine and the rest of the world united. And they're being shown as being kind. He's kind of framed them as kind. And then you've got Russia that's selfish. So you've got Russia, selfish, evil, black, essentially. Uh, and then you've got uh, the, uh, uh, um, uh, Ukraine and the rest of the world, all of the rest of the world who are kind. Again, surely it can't be that simple. You're either naive or delusional to go down that route. And there he is. It's lovely to see how he's dressed. They're dressed in the US flag. No, nothing wrong with that at all. I sometimes wear a Union Jack uh, T-shirt just like him. And th th But then it goes to his hair as well. He's got the blue and the white in his hair. And it's interesting, you know, down the center there, it's like there's one side and there's the other side. You've got the white of the US flag. That's purity and innocence. You've got the blue of the US flag. That's vigilance, perseverance, justice. So think about all those values that he's even dyed into his hair. He's a, what we might call a dyed in the wool, dyed in the wool in terms of his value system. But again, is it naive or delusional to be this simplistic? A lovely camera angle as well. He's sitting, the camera's on a tripod at his eye level, and then he's got his interviewer who's clearly standing up and grabbing his eye line every now and again. So he doesn't quite know where to look uh, often. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, the hair was the first thing that stood out to me. There's a rare genetic condition uh, that's that's called segmental heterochromia uh, that causes this. And I was wondering if that's it or, you know, just seeing all the other behaviors, it's just probably died. <laughs> but let's let's paint a picture here. So for all of these future videos that we're going to see, you can get a perfect ground to stand on from what all four of us are saying here. On the surface, it seems like he's genuinely concerned about world issues. He says, uh, quote, this conflict is definitely black and white, which gives us a look into how he sees the world rigidly in extremes. 
people who talk in black and white terms tend to really oversimplify stuff and they might have trouble, a lot of trouble seeing nuance. And this kind of thinking can point to a, a, a more fixed mindset, even a radicalized mindset. And he frames this conflict as a good versus evil, which aligns with that simplistic worldview, Mark, like you were just talking about. And he continually frames the issue in moral terms. He uses words like caring and kind, uh, generous and unselfish. And his repeated emphasis on virtue shows that he views himself and people who agree with him as morally superior. So that sense of moral righteousness can serve as a just a blanket justification for extreme actions of all kinds. And the pattern here is typical of people who rationalize violence by casting their opponents as purely evil while they see themselves some morally superior being. But he talks about things like the most important thing in the world and the idea that we all move forward as like one collective unit, I think. This kind of sweeping language means that he feels like he's part of a world-saving mission. He's a superhero in his brain, and I think it's it's a delusion. This is my opinion. Of course, this whole video is our, our, just our opinions. But these people believe their actions, even violence, are justified because they're serving a greater cause. When somebody talks in extremes, anybody in your life... Uh, it, like everything's black and white or good versus evil, it's usually or often a sign that they're struggling to deal with the complexity of real world issues. Finally here, you can see he views himself as the savior. I am the savior, but only for the countries the media is telling him about. He lacks any worldview. He's not showing up in Ghana and Syria and Somalia and Venezuela to help anybody out. This lets us know he's very, very easily influenced by media into black and white thinking, which is what most of the media wants you to think. That's all I got. Please tell me who you are and why are you here? Uh, I'm 56 from the U.S., US uh, from North Carolina originally, so I live in Hawaii now, so flew all the way from Hawaii here. So the question as far as why I'm here, to me, you know, a lot of the other conflicts are gray, but this conflict is definitely black and white. This is about good versus evil. This is a storybook, you know, any movie we've ever watched, this is definitely evil against good. I mean, we're battling a situation here where, you know, the U Ukrainians and the rest of the world are caring and kind and, and generous and, and unselfish and, and take care of one another. And it's just a matter of you know, we need to stand up for that. That is the most important thing in the world is just to show human beings that we're kind and we're caring and that we take care of one another and that the world is united so that we feed each other and make sure that, you know, we, we all move forward as, as one collective whole unit. So, you know, we feel the pain of, of one country's failure and their conflicts and we enjoy the successes of, of other countries that are doing good and, and we all work together and for some reason, Russia does not grasp this concept that we're we're all one unit and we have to get along and work together and 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 be normal human beings. This is 2022. We have to work together. It's it's it seems asinine that we have a, a leader in a country that does not understand the concept of of being unselfish and being generous and being kind and just the basic moral values that, that are required by human beings these days. It blows my mind. And um, what are you doing here in Ukraine? Uh, my initial goal was to come and fight. I think you know everybody around the globe should be motivated to come here and support the Ukrainians and support the army, no matter what gender, age, anything. Everybody should be here supporting the army, but. I'm 56, so initially they were like, well, I have no military experience. So they're like, you're not an ideal candidate. So they said, not right this minute. So plan B was to come here to Kiev and promote getting more people here. You know, we need thousands and thousands and thousands of people here fighting with the Ukrainians. We need, we need, you know, we've got 190 countries around the world 
and we need thousands from, from all of them. If, if, if the governments will not send their official military, then we civilians have to pick up the torch and make this thing happen. And we've gotten some wonderful people here, but it's a small fraction of the number that should be here. If we have 5,000 you know, to, to 10,000 people here fighting, you know, that is just a minuscule amount of the five billion people on the globe. You know, we need everyone here fighting. That's that's why I'm in Kiev. So uh, every project that I promote is about getting people who are here to support the Ukrainians. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, decent question. What are you doing here in the Ukraine? <laughs> it's like, like, yeah, I... That's a fair, that's a very fair question. What's his answer to that? Well, before he gives his answer, we've got a vocal click that happens there. We've got a little bit of a lip lick that happens there. We've got kind of a lean to one side that goes with that and a ah uh, that comes with that, a loss of fluency. There's four things that we didn't, I believe, see in our video before on a very fair and simple question. So I think there's some stress around this question, because what is he doing there? Well, it seems like there's a discrepancy between what he came for and what is actually happening. He came, as you've said, Greg, really to be a, a mercenary, paid or, or unpaid. He said, you know, I'm here to fight. Uh, I, as far as I can understand, they've they've gone well, you've got no, you've got no experience and no training, and that usually means you'll, you know, you'll kill more of your own side than you will the the, the, the opposition. So or get it's very da- yeah, it's just very dangerous to have those people around on the whole. So fair enough, they've they've gone no. Well, he's, he's beautifully and again maybe naively or optimis or, or or delusionally optimistic. He says not right at the minute. He says they I can't. I'm not in. Not right at the minute. Oh, so there may be a time in the future when they'll go. Yeah, this now's your time. Now's your time. Now we'd actually like to lose more of our own side than their side. So he's he's optimistic that he will potentially will get a chance. But there's a great stress between what he expected and what is actually being delivered to him. Um, now, he says, if governments want to send their military, if governments, sorry, if governments won't send their military, it's us to uh, uh, up to us civilians to carry the torch, carry the torch. Again, lovely metaphor, because I don't think he's actually talking about carrying, you know, a, f- a flashlight or a lit kind of brand of some sort. Carry the torch. That's usually a metaphor of um, carrying forward the values and the belief, carrying forward the belief because others won't carry that forward. It's up to me, it's up to us to carry forward that light instead of the darkness. So again, we've got this binary thing. We've got black, white, good, evil, light and darkness. He is a light carrier. He's a light bearer, you know, into the future. And uh, uh, and also, he there's this belief here that he's asking potentially five to eight billion people. He says there's five billion people on the planet. There's around, you know, usually around seven point eight to eight at the moment, I would say. So he's got the number wrong. Okay, fair enough. You're you're a little bit out there. But there is a either naivety or delusion that everybody else on the planet should show up on the border of Ukraine with Russia and fight Russia. Well, yeah, you you would you you'd win or you'd get nuked completely and it would be be utter Armageddon. It would be horrible and awful either way. But we know that's just not rational at that point. So already video two, in my mind, he's moved from naivety into an irrational train of thought. But just as everybody's been saying, it is pushed by this light bearing attitude, that he is the torchbearer, he's moving forward. It it comes at the moment from a place, as everybody's saying, of deep belief in something. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, same stuff. I'm going to cover some of the same things, a little bit of a different twist. One of the things to remember is that people are not who they think they are, they're who other people think they are. And if you surround yourself, I would say a fish tastes like what it swims in. If you surround yourself with an echo chamber, it gets louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And the worst echo chamber on earth is your skull. And eventually people get into their own skull and then they just sit there and roll this stuff over and over and over in their head. And it becomes fact. One of the things you have to be careful of, prisoner handling, one of the things you have to be careful of is locking people in solitary because they will get to things that aren't real going on in their head. So one of the things that we know is you have to manage prisoners carefully. So let's talk about true believers. 
I'm a true believer. I believe in the United States, have defended it, have put my life on the line for it, have even protected other people's lives. Chase has done the same thing. There's nothing innately wrong with being a true believer, but you should be seeking outside counsel as well to try to understand. So those echo chambers then become what happens. And in today's world, this is the best echo chamber on earth. You can find any group for any, if you want to dress like a baby, you can find other people who like dressing like a baby and you can dress like a baby better than they do. So this kind of stuff is all over the place. You can find whatever you want to do and boil down to the point where you are the, you know, your Maslow is satisfied by something that nobody else is this. Now he goes over there. He's going to go and save the world over there. I agree with you guys. He's got some kind of savior thing going on there. And he's gotten to the point, the way you can tell that, Mark, you brought it up in the first one, is he's gotten to this point where everything is black and white. When you get to black and white, the person is no longer taking rational inputs, and they're going to have that identified that single bad actor. Trust me, if you think that Russia is the bad actor in the world, the only bad actor in the world, you, you probably haven't read a whole lot to your point, Chase. So there we go. Then he gets, it's interesting because I always talk about emotional eye accessing and you can see it in him here as he drifts down into his right as he recalls being rejected, being rejected by these guys because he's too old and no experience. You call that dead weight in the military. He would be somebody you got to drag along with you and he's worth less effort than nobody. So it's tough. He's either looking at the camera or he's looking at somebody to try to make his point. That forehead is up. He's trying to get his point across. And then once he actually starts to get it, you'll see him change here, coming in a video that forehead will drop altogether. Extremists of all types are this way. What happens is they become so enamored with whatever the cause is that they keep driving. And if they become disillusioned, then you've got a serious problem. I talked to you last week about trust and about hope. Hope makes people hang on for longer. Trust makes them work within the system. When that person becomes disillusioned, they lose trust in the system. They're likely to take harsh actions. And we know that. We see it all the time. There's a guy named Timothy McVeigh who blew up a federal building and killed children, innocent people, because he believed that he would start a civil war. That's kind of crazy. But he had gotten that point of lack of trust. And we see it all the time in domestic and international terror. Chase, what do you got? Really agree with you. And Mark, you were talking about that vocal click. I know that Zoom is going to mute it out, but Scott can lay it in after. Could you just get like a demonstration of it really quick? Yeah, yeah. This is this is what it sounds like. Open the door or I'm going to throw. Just like that. Perfect. That's, and just so people know at home. Yeah, yeah. So fully agree. And this repeated insistence on needing thousands from every country, the idea that he says if the governments will not send their official military, I, I don't know about an unofficial military, <laughs> but he says we civilians have got to pick up that torch. He's overestimating what people without military experience could actually contribute. This also, I think, ties back to grandiosity. He's not thinking about realistic military logistics uh, He's instead just imagining this global civilian army rising up like a call to arms for this moral cause. And I believe, I, in my opinion, in his head, he thinks that he could have contributed to a military action. I think that he thought that he would really contribute to some in some kind of military capacity. So, man, if there's one thing that uh, military training gives you is like, I am fragile all the time. It doesn't make you feel more tough. It makes you understand how fragile you are as a little tiny human being. But his language is really radical. He says, we civilians got to pick up the torch, make this thing happen. He's advocating for regular people to take military action into their own hands, which can be pretty dangerous thinking, especially when coming somebody with no military background. This kind of thinking usually comes with people who are idealistically driven, where they get so caught up in moral cause, they lose sight of political or, yeah, the political, geopolitical reality. And there's more evidence of the grandiosity, with more black and white thinking and this sense of moral duty that were present in the first video. And when somebody speaks in absolutes and seems desperate 
for other people to join their cause. Think of those two things, just those two things. If you spent your whole life on the lookout for those two things, absolutes and desperation to join the cause, that would keep you out of a lot of cults. So people who feel that their mission is the only way in the world almost always have trouble understanding why other people can't see it the same way. So this kind of thinking can lead to increasingly radical behavior, especially if they're feeling like they're not getting any support. Like, why aren't people listening? I have to do something more drastic and more drastic. So that's what I think we're seeing now. The next video is even better. But uh, Greg, what do you got? Scott, no, that's me. Got? We talk in between these. That's why we always get, <laughs> always get confused about where we're going with these things. Anyway, so I'll go. Um, I don't think this guy understands fully what fighting means. I mean, me and Mark got a pretty good idea, but I think this guy's under the impression that it's why I ought to punch you square on the nose, Mr. Man. And I think I, I think that's what he thinks it is. I don't think like Greg and Chase would understand what fighting and violence really is because this guy's he doesn't have that look on him or in him. I don't think that he's ever even seen that in person. You know, there's a look you get after a while when, when somebody sees that, you can, you can sort of spot it on him. He doesn't have that. I don't think he knows what he's come over there to do some fight. Sounds like something he'd tell some girl in a bar somewhere. He's trying to sound cool on his way over. Where are you going after this, Ukraine? I'm going to be fighting. Yeah, that, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, I got it's my own body bit. armor and everything. Yeah, that's yeah, right. That'll work. The SHK. So, bum, 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 bum. so I, I can't imagine him organizing anything. What if these thousands of people showed up? Who's going to organize them? This guy? Nah, I don't think so, man. Not after what we saw at the golf course there. I mean, he, he doesn't look like he's got it together at all. Not even a little bit when it comes to, to being tactical. I don't know much about that at all either. But I know better than that. I think me and Mark could, could fight off a bunch of people better than this guy could, you know, I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's really weak. And, uh, Mark's probably got a letter opener within. Yeah. Well, here's, here's what I do is hire the right people. <laughs> this wouldn't be the guy to organize. Yeah. If you were hiring, <laughs> sorry, Scott, yeah. I've interrupted you twice. I no, yeah. dude, it's, he just can't even get to where he needs to be is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think he knows where to go. He just knows he needs to be there, and he's heard Keeve on TV. That's what it sounds like to me. That's what it sounds like. I, I don't think he knows. I don't think he gets it, man. I don't think he understands what fighting is. I really don't. It's, it's just, it's just, it's odd behavior. So I, I think this personality type is malleable. And with what he's talking about, you can control that person. If you were, this isn't a a, a cult leader. This is a cult follower. This guy, it's that malleable personality. You just have to say, hey, man, we're do I believe that too. And I believe this. See how those hook together? And he'd believe it hooked together. And he'd be right in your, your bunch of people you're collecting in your cult. And I think maybe that, that might be partly what's happened. But he's believing what he's saying in, in his head. Like you were saying, Greg, it's an echo chamber in there. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it just, I think this is a dangerous personality type, this guy, because, simply because he can be controlled by somebody who's dangerous and get him to do things, you know, to join my cult, go over here and, and bite with these people, even though he didn't know it, he'd be the first guy to go, you know, well, and, and, and no, sorry, go, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, there are plenty of people who are older who fight, but you need to understand how military operations work or you're in the way. I mean, for example, the world I came from, the world Chase came from are so dr Forget the 20 plus years of difference in the way people fight now versus in my military years. His training and my training would be so dramatically different. It was tough. I don't know about in your day, Chase, but it was tough to do joint force stuff because you had to do a lot of prep and doing all those kinds of things, different kind of communication stuff, everything. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I I, I don't think he, he grasps what he's, I don't think he understands what he's talking about. It's, it's something he's, created in his mind is what he thinks violence and fighting is. That's what I think. You know, one of my favorite uh, sayings of all time is everybody wants to be a gangster until it's time to do gangster shit. And when it comes time to do gangster shit, this guy's going to be in big trouble. Yeah. Right, are we good? You know what? If, if anybody's saying he's too old, if you watch like Jason Bourne and think about those kind of operatives that are doing that kind of crap around the world, the average age is like 55 of those kind of dudes. 
And they, like me, Chase, know how to use a letter opener. You're going to get us kicked off YouTube. Put your weapon up. I knew you had that. (laughs) I'll I'll paraphrase you. This guy's not king of the babies. He's just another baby. (laughs) And um, what are you doing here in Ukraine? Uh, My initial goal was to come and fight. I think, you know, everybody around the globe should be motivated to come here and support the Ukrainians and support the army. No matter what gender, age, anything, everybody should be here supporting the army. But I'm 56, so initially they're like, well, I have no military experience. So they're like, you're not an ideal candidate. So they said, not right this minute. So plan B was to come here to Kiev and promote getting more people here. You know, we need thousands and thousands and thousands of people here fighting with the Ukrainians. We need, we need you know, we've got 190 countries around the world. And we need thousands from, from all of them. If, we, if, we, if the governments will not send their official military, then we civilians have to pick up the torch and make this thing happen. And we've gotten some wonderful people here, but it's a small fraction of the number that should be here. If we have 5,000 you know, to, to 10,000 people here fighting, you know, that is just a minuscule amount of the 5 billion people on the globe. You know, we need everyone here fighting. That's that's why I'm in Kyiv. So uh, every project that I promote is about getting people over here to support the Ukrainians. This is the most important thing going on in the world today. So sitting around and letting life go on as normal and complaining about gas prices and complaining about, you know, your luxury life in whatever country you live in is unacceptable. As human beings, we must support each other. We cannot turn our backs on anyone around the world and expect the problem to go away. Dang it, I didn't mean to kick us out of that. Damn it. That's okay. It's good. Time. Ready? I know we need to mouth off for a minute to get out of our system, though. That will be okay. Oof. All right. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, there's a lot more delusional speech here, and I thought it was interesting that he's about supporting people the media tells you to support. And I wonder if he would offer that support, that like caring support to people who ideologically disagree with him. Hmm. I don't think so. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it's interesting. There's, there's a again, a dichotomy going on because his, his rhetoric is, is really quite good. You know, what he's saying is actually really quite, um, I guess, you know, morally on track, let's say. If you were looking for somebody to be saying something where you go, that's a really kind of moral thing to say, he's saying some pretty moral stuff. But he doesn't have the gestures to go with it as as yet. These gestures that go with it are kind of, it's like he's kind of, I don't know, like frothing some washing around in a sink somewhere. One side of his body is doing something different from the other as he kind of moves the water around. They're quite kind of watery gestures. But his 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 morality is pretty direct, but he doesn't have the gestures to go with it. He's got this wishy-washy gesturing. So with that, I'm going to say internal conflict. There's what he's saying or what he's picked up let's just say from the groups that he's with or the tv that he watches chase he's picked up the right moral rhetoric but there's something in his body that isn't quite convinced about it and that internal conflict i think that could cause problems in the future that could be what's causing this big problem that he's got himself into that he he is conflicted inside uh greg what do you got on this one yeah mark i think what we're seeing is him work it out i think he's pontificating and coming up with his message as he goes i think he's got the roots of it to your point but he's going and and i think that's what we're seeing the other interesting piece here is he's found somebody who will listen to his views watch his brow drop it was up those first two videos this one is down and then he's just as congruent as a day is long in the way he's messaging to i think to your point where he's doing all this is because he's working through his message so i think yeah i, I true believer easy enough and to your point chase true believer in this message let me also say if you live in russia your opinion of whether russia is the bad actor may be very different than the people in ukraine so both sides probably have very different and very gray and complex understandings of the situation. This guy's not capable of looking at that because he's gone so far down one path. Scott, what do you got? 
something. All right. I think it's interesting when he looks at the camera. You know, he moves away from the interviewer and down to the camera. And I believe when he's looking at the camera, he's talking to people he believes are like him. He's talking to his people who I don't think are there. I think he's just talking out to the to the nothingness uh, when it comes to that. But so I thought that was interesting. When he looks down at the camera, he's talking to the people he thinks he's connecting with and sparking that fire up in him to be to come along with his message because he's he thinks he's leading them to this you know in this cause that he's not going to be able to lead. He's just going to be part of it. I don't know. I can't I can't get the this can't figure it out. And then he's a lot of people are going to think he's got. Uh, He's showing contempt because his smile is crooked like that. I have a crooked smile. I put a picture up on on my community thing on my channel, and I put these pictures up and go, "What do you see here? What's a, what are the facial expressions?" And on mine, everybody's like, "Contempt and smiles." That picture, Greg. Remember, we took pictures in front of uh, those, our dressing rooms at Doctor Phil's show. That's me standing there smiling. Took a selfie, and part of my mouth, like it is now, part goes up. Everybody thinks I'm being uh, uh, have contempt for something or I've had a stroke. So I just have a crooked smile. I've had it since I was a kid. And I think that's what's going on here. I don't think he's had, um, what, is, what is the other thing when you when your face droops? Palsy. Bell's palsy. Bell's, Bell's palsy. I don't think he's had, he may have, I don't know. But I don't think he's had anything like that. I think it's just a crooked smile on this guy. And an, an odd thing here is we don't, when we see movement in the brow, it's not a whole lot. We did the video before this one, I think, when it was up and then came down. But here, it, it's just kind of, it might be the angle, it might be the shine on his head or something, but it doesn't look to me like there's very much movement in there. He's got that flat affect when he's talking, everything seems the same, and he's he's just talking right along, his, and his eyebrows don't do much. I don't think we've seen any any movement in the glabella, really, at all. I don't see him drawn together. when he, he, I don't see concern when he's supposed to be talking about things he's concerned about. I'm not seeing any of those things at all. No stress, really. I mean, it's. it's I, I don't. I don't know how to explain it because I've. I've only seen this in, in, in my opinion, crazy people before when they're talking stuff and it's like you know, schizophrenics or something when they're talking and they believe what they're saying. I believe he believes what he's saying with all this. So, I don't know. I, I think two minutes with this guy, and anybody would say something's not wrong, not right about this guy. Something's wrong here with this guy. All right, we good. Hmm. Okay, Mark, you win that one. Yeah, obviously. I mean, obviously. I knew that was mine. This is the most important thing going on in the world today. So sitting around and letting life go on as normal and complaining about gas prices and complaining about, you know, your luxury life in whatever country you live in is unacceptable. As human beings, we must support each other. We cannot turn our backs on anyone around the world and expect the problem to go away. So I've been dealing with Russia for my entire life. You know, we had one period where it was okay, but now we've let it slip, slip back into, into terror, terrorism. So it's just the world needs to respond. You know, the why world leaders are not sending military is beyond me. We're going to have to elect new leaders the next go around that have a backbone and that you know have the fortitude to say, hey. We're not going to tolerate this type of behavior. This type of behavior is unacceptable anywhere, anywhere, any place. You know, so it's just it's, it's totally unacceptable. And, and why people are not responding, I, I do not know. All right, Greg, what do you got? So some of the few facial expressions I've seen is in this case, it looks like he has some disdain. You see the side of his mouth draw back when he talks about Russia. Interesting. It's good body language for the message he's sending. There's more of telling the way it is. I told you we wouldn't talk a whole lot about that. Let's talk about how I would approach this guy. He's given us this kind of worked his hands and tried to explain his, whatever his manifesto is, whatever he's thinking. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying I'm going to defend people who can't defend themselves. Nothing wrong with that at all. But this guy, I think we all believe, is, has some kind of a savior complex going on. So I would pray on that. I would lean into him and I would just say, hey, man, Tell me about when you went to Ukraine. Just tell me all about it. You know, tell me how you got here. Get him started talking. And if you can get him to start talking about Ukraine, we know he has passion around it. Once he does that, his his words are filled with source leads. Every day when you're talking to anyone, you'll hear stress on certain words. Those certain words 
Explain what source leads are. Yeah. Okay. Those certain words are what we call source leads because those certain words carry enough information that there's something hidden there. So we'll pull that out and say, okay, explain that to me a little more. Give me a little more detail. And if it's something hot, like, hey, I, I was going in this building and I saw uh, weapons stored there. We're on that. If it's something that just meant something to the person, then we'll go back and pick it up later. We'll call that a cold lead versus a hot lead. But when a person's talking, they constantly are dripping information because of how they stress words, of how words don't fit the conversation, of all the passion they put into it. And you can see it here, that disdain for Russia. I would poke on him a little bit if I sit in a room. But once you get him talking, you do pride and ego up on this guy. And what that means is I'm going to say, you're smart. You know the world better than most people. You've been to combat. You get it. Tell me about it. Then you'll start to ramble, rattle, rattle, rattle. And if he's narcissistic and believes that he has a better handle on it than others, you wait until you get him to a certain point and then you drive home. You go after him and tell him, well, that's Dunning Kruger. You have no idea what you're talking about. You would have gotten more people killed. All the same things we're saying about him, you attack him with and he'll lash out and come back at you. In the same way you use flattery and criticism in elicitation, you do it in the interrogation room through approaches, through psychological ploys. Most people that are going to follow a cause don't go as far as this guy has gone. Who knows? They're probably going to find out maybe Vance, the Vance pick was a big deal for him. We don't know any of that. They want to know, and they want to know if he's a single actor. Is he part of an organization? How did he come to this resolution? How did he get this weapon? There's going to be a whole lot of things that they're going to want to know. And so they have to be careful and balance the closing of the, the equation with getting what they need. And that is a, a, a talent that they will have a lot of people who know how to do. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So remember those gestures we were talking about before. And I think, Greg, I think you got it right. He's, he's trying to work it out as he go as he, he's going along. His rhetoric is really sure, but there's something in his body that isn't quite sure of what he's saying. Well, now he gets sure because I think he does a chop down gesture right down what I would call his wheel plane, that center line. So it's like his mind has come together on something and chops down potentially into the palm of his hand. I can't quite see, but my imagination thinks that it might be right down into the palm. Very definitive gesture. What's he definitive about here? Why world leaders are not sending military is beyond me. Why world leaders are not sending military is beyond me. He's definitive about how he can't understand why world leaders are not sending military. Well, again, that's naive. By anybody's estimation, that's Naive. I mean, just to go through it with you, to help a country, you don't necessarily, you certainly sometimes would not send actual military. You might send what we call aid, which might be money or weapons, or you might circumnavigate in some way by sending somebody else's military, not your military, and a whole bunch of other things that maybe shouldn't be talked about, okay? So there's all kinds of ways of doing this, and it's naive to say just because a country doesn't have boots on the ground that you can see that there isn't any help from other countries. Listen, I'm not saying that anybody should help or they shouldn't help or there's enough help or there isn't enough help. I'm not saying any of that at all. I'm saying it's naive to say that nobody else is 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 helping uh, in, in any way. It's just naive to the complexity of the situation. And that leads us to understand once again, this black and white thinking. Unless I'm seeing American boots on the ground, it is beyond me that they're not helping. They are sitting idly by. They're now idle and not proactive. So what does he want? What does he want? Well, he tells us exactly what he wants in a leader. Backbone, fortitude, intolerance to Russian behavior. Backbone, fortitude, and an intolerance to that Russian behavior. So think about this act that <laughs> has meant that, you know, he's ended up in our sights at this point. Does he think that the person he went out to shoot had no backbone, had no, fortune, uh, had no fortitude, and was tolerant of Russian behavior? That would fit why he might come to the end of his rope there and, and want to deliver that kind of final blow. It's a possibility. It's possible from what he's saying. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. I, I, I agree with you. And I think this is another... Um, 
It's delusions of grandeur. It's another example of that. He starts talking about what he says. I've been dealing rush with Russia my entire life. You know, that's like he's on the inside of something. Like he's been doing this part, you know, his whole life, man. He knows all about it. So that that, that that's kind of odd. And these non-negotiable statements he's making, you know, this shouldn't be done anywhere. We can't do this. This is not uh, what is it? not acceptable anywhere. Really? Says who? You know. It's these non-negotiable things that just say, this guy is, in my opinion, you know, I could be wrong, but he seems a little unhinged to me. So this is what a, a true believer looks like. So that's, you guys have covered a lot of it. That's all I got. Chase, what do you got? Yep. That was the biggest thing for me, too, just dealing with Russia my whole life. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah, man. That's all I got. <laughs> okay. So I've been dealing with Russia for my entire life. You know, we had one period where it was okay, but now we've let it slip, slip back into, into terror, terrorism. So it's just the world needs to respond. You know, the, why world leaders are not sending military is beyond me. We're going to have to elect new leaders the next go around that have a backbone and that you know have the fortitude to say, hey. We're not going to tolerate this type of behavior. This type of behavior is unacceptable anywhere, anywhere, any place. You know, so it's just it's, it's totally unacceptable. And, and why people are not responding, I, I do not know. No. What uh, impressed you the most since you are here? Uh, my trip to Irpin was, was pretty emotional. So you know, going and seeing the buildings that were burnt, burned and and destroyed and things of that nature. I think more emotional for me is also is just talking to the guys that have come here. You know, when you talk to a 20 year old guy that sold everything he owns to come here and fight, that is heroism. You know, he's coming here to risk his life for humanity, for the Ukrainians, you know, guys that sell everything they own to come here and support the Ukrainians while others sit at home and, and and do nothing, you know? All right, Chase, what do you got? Right here, he acknowledges the emotional weight of witnessing all these war-torn uh, villages and, and cities. But it's interesting that he rapidly shifts his focus to something else that moved him even more. This is the people. And this shows maybe that the devastation of the war affects him but it's the human stories of sacrifice and heroism that truly resonate with him. And he has got an emotional response that seems tied less to physical damage and more to symbolic aspects, symbolic aspects of people giving things up. And in his eyes, I think the willingness to give up everything and risk your life for some kind of cause is the ultimate form of bravery and nobility. This admiration for sacrifice ties back to the grandiosity in the other clips, and he's drawn to these big symbolic gestures. So viewing them as the highest moral action, just the symbol, not the act, the symbol of what's going on. And this we're back to Jean Baudrillard, which we don't have time to really get into. But there's frustration and judgment just oozing out of this guy. And I think the man has no patience, no understanding for anybody who is not knee deep in, in chaos. And I think it's the same all or nothing lunacy that we've seen before. And I think in his warped view, you're either a hero sacrificing everything or you're a useless bystander. And I think this this black and white thinking that, that's going on here, it's back with a vengeance and he can't fathom. He cannot fathom the middle ground or why somebody might not be able to dive head first into this madness or craziness here. So to him, it's cut and dry. Be a hero or you are a moral failure. And I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, even though we get this a little emotional breakup, you know, thing in where he where he's, uh, gets emotional and cries a little bit there. We don't see a whole lot of movement in the, in the in the brow. We don't see anything in the chin, boss. We don't see the things we should see. When I think he's actually feeling that emotion. Yeah. yeah. But I, but he just doesn't look right on him. We're not seeing the things that we see classically in a person who is supposedly feeling the, that emotion. Who's feeling, uh, I don't want to say sadness, but an emotional upheaval. 
there because uh, what he's he's when he talks about these people who sold all their stuff and come over there and everything, I think he may see himself as that. I think he's he's identifying with that and saying, I'm that guy too. And that's why he's talking about him like that, making these big heroes, because that's what he is. So in other words, he's telling you what he is as he's getting emotional and crying about that, you know? So this is, it's just really, it really makes me feel bad for him, you know, in a way. I mean, I don't, but I, but when you see somebody doing that, you're like, man, you're, you're gone. This is, that's, that's too bad. So I think he sees waiting, himself as one of those. I'm waiting for but, the comments on that one. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I don't feel, now, hold on a minute. Thank you. I don't feel sorry for this guy. No, I'm saying <laughs> people like this guy. Rewind it. Listen to what I said. I, I, I corrected it there and then Chase brought it up and I did it again. No, I don't feel sorry for this guy. He's a, you know what? No. So I want to make sure that we know that I don't feel sorry for this guy, not even a little bit, but it's people like him that haven't gone this far. They're just a little, that have the same kind of situation with them. It's sad to see, you know, not on this guy. I don't care what happens to this cat, but uh, thanks Chase. <laughs> thanks for the save there to make sure. Um, but then again, everything he's talking about, everything we're seeing in him, every, that, that flat affect, that that belief in what he's talking about, how he leans into that, it, it's a true believer. It's a classic true believer from Eric Hoffer's book, The True Believer. Greg, what do you got? A couple of things. I, at this point, he's done nothing wrong. This is 2022, so I'm not going to critique him about what he's done right or wrong at this point. What I will say is I'm not sure the emotion is not about the fact he's failed at the thing you're talking about because he may have sold whatever he has. He's gone there, but he was not accepted. And that's tough. If your status of a hero is to go and die in combat, which by the way, I don't know a single soldier who ever said, I want to go die in combat. We all want to overwhelm with force our enemies and not die in combat. Ideally, fewer gunshots are ideal. The, the whole concept of the U S military has traditionally been to be so powerful. You don't want to engage us. That's the best way to go to war is not and so when you go, then somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to die. And there's not any glory in overwhelming people with firepower either, but it saves lives on both sides, usually. Anyway, all that aside, and somebody's going to beat me up down the bottom because I'm pro-war, I'm pro this. Nope, I'm a soldier, and soldiers don't like war. Politicians like war is what I usually tell people. Yeah. Watch the. What's the beautiful thing, though, is you know he's really emotional because – and I'll get this probably wrong, but I think the human head weighs about 13 pounds, all the bones and neck and all that. And when you tilt your head down into that emotional eye accessing, watch him. Most emotional we've seen him, it changes your entire posture. It arches your back or it concaves your back and everything about you changes. Look at him. You can't miss it. It's a beautiful thing. He gets sorrow as his tips of his brows rise up. You can't miss it. He's really feeling this. Now, what he's feeling, we can't tell. We can't read minds. We're reading symptoms. And if I were interrogating him, I'd lean over and go, it's okay. It's okay. I know you tried. I'd pet him on his shoulder and talk to him and just try to make him feel like I understood. And you, you did everything possible. You sold everything. You came here. And they wouldn't take you. Now I can turn the tables on him and have him now maybe start to say they wouldn't take me. And here's why. And then you start driving a wedge between him and his ideology. And that's how you get people who are not stable to come apart and start giving you information unintentionally. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, maybe just a reiteration of everything that everybody said, because I think you're all spot on here. Uh, I think, uh, as we said, I think the emotion is is real. Now, now, you know, there's sadness there, there's sorrow there, potentially grief, potentially the loss of something. What might it be the loss of? I think you're right, Scott. He does want to be the 20 year old who sold everything and has come to risk his life for humanity. I mean, that's a big deal. Imagine yourself 20, you sell everything and you go to risk your life for humanity. That's a film. That is a hero. That is something absolutely epic. And when you realize, when you come to terms with the fact that you are not 20, you've got a lot around you and you are not going to risk your life for humanity. I mean, you might risk your life for a few people around you, but not everybody. It's like not everybody's important in your life. Some people are way more important than others. And some people you just don't know about. And it's like, I, you know, I really don't have the capacity to really care or think about them. You realize that you're not that superhero, but you desperately wanted to be. I mean, at a level which of, of, of naivety or delusion and that hits you that one part hits the other there could be a real sense of of loss there and we'll come to grief 
uh, a, a little bit later in the next next one. But what, what, what is it grief for? What is he? Well, he is the crusader. He's the crusader. He wants to be that warrior monk, that monk, you know, pious, just uh, has... has uh, throws away everything, sells everything, has nothing but the sword and the clothes on his back and walks into the face of, of death. It is a romantic, idealised view of conflict, just like you said right at the start, start, Scott. Has he ever really seen somebody dead in front of him due to his hands? I think maybe not. But does he have an idealized romantic view of what that could be like on an epic scale for a hero like him? Yeah, I think he does. And I think at this point that has been punctured because he's not going to get to do that in the Ukraine, in Ukraine against this behemoth of evil that he's been dealing with for all his life and so what's he given in the end he's got again this dichotomy these this binary thing it's either sacrifice or apathy and if you don't sacrifice you're sitting at home watching the tv and you're just apathetic it's it's those two things and and just life isn't like that there's a lot a lot of gray and other colors in between there's a lot of difference in between uh, just as you said, Scott, I, I, I know, I know people like this. We've all known people like this. We all, we all know them. Yeah. We know people who've been dealt these cards. But how you play those cards is a different thing. And I can't agree with the way he's dealt the cards. I can be empathetic for sorry, the way he's played the cards. I can be empathetic for the cards that he has in his hand. But some people get to play those cards a lot, a lot better, a lot better. I'll, I'll give you a good example. When I was when I was in the old guard, that is the place where the most, you know, these people who have done more for the country than anybody else are laid to rest. And there was a kid, me and him were talking, you know, you're a young soldier, you're all, I, 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 I want to do this and I want to do that. And I remember this first sergeant named Dale Thornton. I'd like to keep his name going. He's been gone a long time. But he said, son, there's nothing glorious about war. He'd been in Vietnam. He had a very famous picture of this young man in a body bag and his friend standing over him crying. He said, that's my best friend. Nothing glorious about this. Nothing at all. Don't ever pretend there is. And I think that is what old soldiers bring to young soldiers and what keeps that culture moving and keeps people thinking. There's nothing glorious about losing your friend. Keep thinking about war as the last thing you want to do, not the first thing. Um, what uh, impressed you the most since you are here? Uh, my trip to Irpin was, was pretty emotional. So, you know, going and seeing the buildings that were bur burned and, and, and destroyed and things of that nature. I think more emotional for me is also is just talking to the guys that have come here. You know, when you talk to a 20-year-old guy that sold everything he owns to come here and fight, that is heroism. You know, he's coming here to risk his life for humanity. For the Ukrainians, you know, guys that sell everything they own to come here and support the Ukrainians while others sit at home and 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 do nothing. You know, it's it's totally mind blowing how we have this divide of people that are selfless and courageous and wonderful and willing to sell everything they own to come here and support, you know, you know, keep people from getting killed, to shelter kids and, and protect Ukrainians and others that just, you know, want to sit at home and not. It's just, it, it you know, it's an indictment of our entire human society to say, hey, you know, where do we stand? Do we do we stand for for good or, or do we just not care? I mean, does the does the world not care? That's that's the feeling that I, I wrestle with every day, every day in my interactions with everybody. You know, every one of us is responsible for the outcome of this war. Every one of us, you know, by our actions and what we do. And, you know, when I call back home and say, hey, I need five bucks so I can, you know, put some enough money together to get a vest for a Ukrainian and, and I get no response. I'm like, I'm not sure that the world is as wonderful as I once thought it was. I had thought that everyone would respond, you know, very generously and unselfishly and, and you know, 
you don't have to come, but you know, if I ask for five dollars to buy a vest, vest to save a Ukrainian life, uh, it seems like that would be a no-brainer. But I, I, I increasingly get more disappointed in, in humanity, and I'm beginning to question whether or not we're going to end up on the right side of this equation. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, uh, here's the mindset here, uh, and his mind is blown by this. There's two types of people in the world. I want you to work out which, which type you are. They're selfless, courageous, wonderful, sell everything they own, shelter kids and protect, those kinds of people, and then the others just sit at home. That's, there's only two types of people in his view. All of those criteria, and if you don't fulfill those, you're just sitting at home. Now, I think the world is a little more gray. Sometimes I'm a little bit courageous, and sometimes I sit at home. And it can happen within the same day, sometimes. You know, sometimes, you know, I'm protective, and sometimes I sit at home, and that can happen within the week, you know? I don't think I ever do all of those things at once. That, that would... Uh, that would probably cause me to have to sit at home for quite a while. That would be quite a lot of energy, I think. But really, there's just good people and then everybody else who doesn't care. They just don't care. We know that's not rational, OK? So we have something that is delusional and irrational going on here. Another irrational idea, if he doesn't get five dollars from somebody for what he what he uh, what he needs he says i'm not sure the world is as wonderful as i thought it was imagine you go look we need five dollars so we can get you know the army something just need you five dollars and if he doesn't get that five dollars from people like the world isn't as wonderful as it was anymore he questions humanity because he's not being given what he wants he questions humanity that is depressed and it's nihilistic okay so we're getting this combination of of what i would say is depressed and nihilistic and in a, in a uh, somewhat of a innocent or fantastical delusional world now uh, let's just talk about the stages of grief. I remember a few episodes uh, ago, uh, Greg, you talked about Kubler-Ross and, and the stages of grief. You've got denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But when you look at those that cycle or those stages, what people tend to, to think is that these stages happen in some kind of order, and they don't. Uh, Kubler-Ross never said, never said that. Uh, the idea was is that you know, a certain environment can trigger a certain stage. You can go back to another stage. You can go forward through some stages. You can skip through what might seem a sequence. Now, you don't know quite where it's going to go. So, look, is this somebody who has lost faith, belief in, in humanity and therefore is in a depressed, nihilistic state? Could could this be his bargaining position? You know what? I'll go. I'll go and I'll offer myself. Here's my bargain. I'll offer myself. I'll offer my life for this. And in return, you will give me I'll die and you will give me faith again in humanity. That's a great that's a that's a strong, strong offer. But they've gone. Uh, no, mate. No. No, we don't, we don't even want your life on this one. Well, could you flip to anger? On that, I'm not saying he has, but could you flip to anger on that? And what might you do, you know, if you had this somewhat naive or even massively delusional world, what might you do with that anger? Again, I'm not saying anything that he's done is the right thing to do. I'm just putting forward my opinion on what might be happening in this situation. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? So, Mark, I'm going to sound like you for a minute. The Norse gods, all in that old religion, you had to leave your body through an open wound, you know, Viking era, to go to Valhalla. Some people have this delusion, you know, leaving through an open wound is a good idea. I'd like to leave just of old age and wait for it. You know, maybe I won't make Valhalla, but I might wave on my way by. <laughs> the whole open wound thing is overrated, is my opinion. Just based on what I've seen, it doesn't seem to be a pleasant way out. But the, people will get to that point based on something in their life, some glory or something if they've not had glory or somewhere in there. I'm not even going to talk to that part. I just want you to think about that affects how people get in their head. That's what glory and warrior, being a warrior is. There's a grand narrative this guy's going into, and, and nobody's listening is the problem. He's big now. He's, he's talking about things in grandiose black and white terms, not little bitty terms he was doing before. And then here's what scares me. Well, now we know why, but he looks down to the right. 
he's emotional. We're thinking about his emotional state as he's talking. But then for the first time, we see concern in his brow and increased blink rate and cadence shift when he starts talking about people being either sitting on the couch or do or fighting war. That makes me think he's moving towards disillusionment. And when a person moves toward disillusionment, they're losing trust. And remember what I talk about is there's a, a, a north-south axis of trust. If you believe and you trust in the system, you'll work through other means. You know, you may try to get a lot of people to help you. You may go through legislation to change things. But when you don't trust the system anymore, you'll burn it down. It's time to set fire to everything. It's time to blow things up. And a person who can see only in black and white and who loses trust in the system and becomes disillusioned becomes dangerous. This may be the moment. I don't know. But we certainly know that he's now decided to take moments into his own hand. Scott, what do you got? Uh, I, I agree. I think this is another situation where we're seeing the uh, the delusion here, the del delusions of grandeur here, because, he, again, he's talking about himself in this, in my opinion. That's what it looks like to me. And uh, th this is part of that whole thing we've seen, that little thread that's been going throughout all the videos. You know, it's there's something happening for him that's not really happening in reality. You know, and that flat, again, the flat effect, the whole, I, I could just cover the same stuff over again, but he, he sees the world one way and that's it. Everybody should be like this. Like, I think you were saying it, Mark, or they've got to be like that. And if you're not like this, then you're not like me. And so you're wrong. And I don't know why you're not like me, you know, because I'm doing this wonderful thing. And I don't know why you don't see that and don't understand it. So it's, um, uh, it's, this is the true believer. This is classic true believer to me, in, in my opinion, anyway. And I think he's dangerous. Obviously, we know that now. It's easy to say, but I mean, this is what it looks like. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think he might do something bad, too. <laughs> but uh, I totally agree. And his belief that everybody in the world is responsible for the outcome of the war shows how much delusional pressure he's putting on himself and he's constantly struggling with this lack of uh, response from everybody, especially when even small things like five bucks is ignored. This makes him question if the world is as good as he thought. And he's maybe his growing disappointment is making him lose faith in humanity's ability to do the right thing, which pushes him towards the feelings of isolation and doubt about the future. Exactly what Greg was just talking about. I didn't realize it until I finished saying that. But uh, this delusional view of humanity is budding up with reality once he's being ignored. So now we have severe cognitive dissonance. And this leads to frustration and isolation. And when a person feels abandoned and believes that others are morally failing, they can be pushed toward way more extreme behaviors, especially if they think they're the ones who care enough to act. And they have they're morally superior. Anybody who believes they're morally superior to another person can be made to do a whole lot of stuff. That's all I got. It's it's totally mind blowing how we have this divide of people that are selfless and courageous and wonderful and willing to sell everything they own to come here and support, you know, you know, keep people from getting killed, to shelter kids and, and protect Ukrainians and others that just, you know, want to sit at home and not. It's just, it, it, you know, it's an indictment of our entire human society to say, hey, you know, where do we stand? Do we, do we stand for, for good or, or do we just not care? I mean, does the, does the world not care? That's, that's the feeling that I, I wrestle with every day, every day in my interactions with everybody. You know, every one of us is responsible for the outcome of this war. Every one of us, you know, by our actions and what we do. And, you know, when I call back home and say, hey, I need five bucks so I can, you know, put some enough money together to get a vest for a Ukrainian and, and I get no response. I'm like, I'm not sure that the world is as wonderful as I once thought it was. I had thought that everyone would respond, you know, very generously and unselfishly and, and you know, you don't have to come, but you know, if I ask for five dollars to buy a vest, vest to save a Ukrainian life, uh, it seems like that would be a no-brainer. But I, I, I increasingly get more disappointed in, in humanity, 
And I'm beginning to question whether or not we're going to end up on the right side of this equation. All right, we've taken a look at these videos, and I think we've all pretty much made up our mind about what we've seen. Mark, how are things looking to you so far? Well, they're looking polarized, aren't they? There's, there's black and there's white, there's good and there's bad. And, you know, if you've got the belief that, you know, this side is good and that side is bad, it's a belief and no evidence that anybody can bring you is probably going to change your mind around that. Beliefs tend to change over decades and decades and decades, usually like 30 to 40 years to change a group's beliefs or an individual's beliefs. Or you go through, you know, some traumatic changes where you realize, well, the world doesn't function, the universe doesn't function how I thought it was. And then there's a whole grief cycle that you tend to go through as those beliefs uh, change. But your, your ability to change somebody else's beliefs quickly, well, fast, I mean, most of those methods are against the Geneva Convention. So it's never really going to happen. All we can do is just monitor ourselves. And you may be thinking, as we've been talking about black and white thinking, well, that's not me. Well, you've already done black and white thinking, haven't you, by going, that's not me. I don't do that. I know I do that. I know I do black and white thinking. And by knowing that I do it, by knowing when I'm doing it, I can go, hang on, do I really want to be doing that? We, we, can, we can look after ourselves. We can't look after everybody else's thinking. Certainly not. But we can look after our own and just all check ourselves when we're doing that black and white thinking, especially, especially right now. Chase, what do you got on this one? Well, it's Serious grandiosity. He doesn't just want to make a difference. He wants to save the world. Uh, so I think there's a Joseph Campbell story arc in here. It's the hero coming back, going out to fight the bad guy, coming back to the village. I think in his mind, he's the only one brave enough to do it. The rest of us are just a bunch of morally bankrupt bystanders. It's delusional, but it's pretty dangerous. When somebody feels like they're the last person standing in a war everyone else is ignoring, things can spiral very quickly. And he is starting to lose faith in humanity. And this kind, this flavor of disillusionment is the perfect breeding ground for extreme desperate actions. We have rigid thinking, moral superiority, and isolation. Those create a behavioral time bomb. So when somebody starts framing the world in absolutes, everything's a fight between good and evil, pay close attention anywhere in your life when you start hearing this. It's usually a sign they're not just oversimplifying stuff. They're probably heading down a path that can get dangerous pretty quick. That's all I got. Greg? Yeah, we, this guy started off with the cause. This cause was grandiose. He's going to be this warrior who's going to go and solve things. That's a very Norse mindset. You know, lots of, lots and lots of legends around people going out, becoming the hero that clears. And look, a, a lot of people have that in their mind. They don't always take the same kind of action. But when he got there, he was rejected. It was a slap in the face. Hey, you're too old. You don't know anything. So what does he do then? He says, okay, I can bring people in. Well, I can't really get people in. I can buy equipment for people. That doesn't happen either. When you have built yourself in your head, whether it's in your head or to your friends, to be the grand hero and you're not, and you've sacri sacrificed everything you own to get there, you're getting damn close to what I call personal extinction. And personal extinction means whatever you have built yourself up to be, there's no more dissonance. You just can't be it. And then you get to this place where, well, maybe there's one last thing I can do. That could be very easily what we're dealing with. Person getting close to the end of the rope and then thinking, well, there's one more thing I can do. What's interesting is I've talked to news folks today who said he's smiling and laughing, standing in the in the court. So he has done his thing. He's done whatever it was he set out to do. Whether he accomplished it or not, not the issue. He went and he put his life on the line, just like he said he would do, in a different arena. That's what I see. And again, we don't read minds. We're just telling you what we can see. If we had seen this two years ago or three years ago, we would have said, that's it. He's going to shoot at Trump. We wouldn't have been able to tell that. What we can do is look backward and study all of these symptoms and tell you what we're seeing and say, hey, this is an indicator. But more importantly, to pay attention to yourself, to yourself, that when you start black and white thinking and you've got a cause and you've got to be the hero and you're rejected, then you're going to go bring in other heroes and then you're rejected. Then you're going to buy body armor and you're rejected and you're down to the last second. Think, think, think. 
I'm not talking about something as extreme as shooting a president, but what I am, or ex president, what I am talking about is something as extreme as destroying your own self because your original image is not what you have now. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I really like this one because it is the perfect example of the of the true believer. I know I'm, I'm talking about the same book all the time. It's not just about some you know, weird sociological. This book, you should read it because you'll learn you'll learn a lot about people in life and the way things work fantastic book and this guy is a true believer so if you read that book and watch this or since you watch this you read that book you'll see how the, you'll see you'll learn so much about what we're talking about and and that view that this guy has on what's happening in the world and his place and part in it and it might give you a, a little insight as to why he's behaving this way mm-hmm. i think it's a great it's a great read it's not very long great book great book so i'd, I'd suggest reading that all right fellas thanks for another good one We'll see you next time.